prepare yourselves for what will probably be the best experience of your military career. Iwo Jima is the site of a major battle between the Imperial Japanese Army and the United States Marine Corps uh, from February to March of 1945. It's been depicted uh, in many Hollywood movies. What I would point out specifically is the flag raising, which has been uh, one of the most widely reproduced images of World War II, and also uh, the invasion beaches, the black sand, something that you've seen probably all over American media. We went out there for a, a tour, professional military education tour, PME as we call it. Uh, we showed at, uh, I think, 5 o'clock in the morning at the passenger terminal here at Kadena. Quickly processed by showing our ID cards, uh, and if I remember correctly, we left for the aircraft around 6.30 in the morning, and we eventually took off at 7.30. About an hour and a half flight, uh, depending on the winds, so uh, an hour and a half, two hours, depending on the winds. And uh, so we took off at 7.30. We roughly landed and de uh, deplaned around 9 o'clock. First stop that we'll make is really only about a few hundred yards away from the base operations building where we started. And it's noteworthy because it's a, a uh, concrete bunker that was used during the battle by the Japanese um, as a headquarters for their colonel who was in charge of their artillery. The building had a number of different lives during its service with the Imperial Japanese Army. Uh, the one it's probably best known for is, it, is as an artillery command post for Colonel Kaido, who was kind of the mastermind of the artillery defensive plan for Iwo Jima. And there's things you can pick up, you know, touch, look at. Uh, again, very rusted over, but they're just sitting there in the grass for people. It's almost like a, a uh, you know, hands-on touching museum. That well. Although we pass a lot of World War II artifacts used by both the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy in the course of our tour, I like to stop in front of this particular bunker because it gives us an opportunity to see a lot of really representative pieces. They have an air soccer rifle, which features a uh, basically an anti-aircraft sight, which is very unique uh, among the world's militaries at that point in time. Uh, also, there's a Japanese version of a flamethrower uh, which was uh, essentially modeled after the United States version uh, because of its success. Predominantly in the kind of defenses you'd find in Iwo Jima. The next stop, after only about another two or three hundred yards, is another group of rusted out, old, weathered uh, pieces of armament, both U.S. and Japanese. Um, there's also pieces of airplanes there. B-29 propeller has been bent up uh, prior from a, a mishap. Uh, pieces of a P-51 uh, radiator, I believe. Various, uh, um, again, pieces of uh, weaponry from both sides. One of the pieces that catches my eye is the dual anti-tank, anti-aircraft artillery piece, a Type 96, which is used extensively over the course of the island, uh, both in area denial weapon and also to attack infantry. Probably one of the most noticeable features is a B-29 Hamilton Standard propeller, which is up on a pedestal there. It's been grievously damaged during a crash landing at some point in the past, but I use it as an opportunity to educate service members on the importance of that base uh, in eliminating the Japanese threat from, that originated from the airfields that were there, in addition to the fact that it was also used as a recovery base for emergency landings that were needed by B-29s returning from the strategic bombing campaign of mainland Japan. As we get closer, I'll stop and uh, point out to the folks uh, an area called the quarry. So it's essentially uh, the furthest north and east point of the landing beaches. It's a, uh, uh, geographically, uh, it is a set of cliffs overlooking the water. And during the battle, it was the extreme right flank for the Marines when they invaded uh, this stretch of beaches. Well, some of the rooftop areas are essentially um, tar pits. This island is still an active volcano, and occasionally uh, there'll be steam vents that are up on the surface. Uh, also, as I mentioned, this, these tar pits, uh, this is going to be superheated liquid that would be dangerous for anyone that's at 
touch them. About halfway down the landing beaches on the way to Suribachi, there's a couple points, a couple monuments. The first one you come to is a monument for the cemetery that was dedicated to the 3rd and 4th Marine Division. It took, provides a great venue to discuss the, uh, the contribution of military working dog teams uh, to the battle. They were interred with Marines at this particular cemetery. But I think the most important point to make here is that this is a combat cemetery. We have a tremendous loss of life that we were not prepared for. Uh, we exhausted the supply of body bags throughout the course of the battle, and we had a need to inter people immediately to prevent uh, disease and other uh, factors from influencing the outcome of the battle. The bodies no longer there. They were disinterred, I think, back in 1968 when we gave the island back to the Japanese. And uh, they took the caskets um, and reinterred them almost entirely in the Punch Bowl Cemetery in Honolulu, Hawaii. The next site that we pass is what's called the Reunion of Honor Memorial. So there's two fraternal organizations, one in the United States and one in Japan. And every 10 years has been uh, reuniting to uh, commemorate their fallen comrades and also use it as an opportunity to educate younger generations about the battle and then really World War II history in general. So this is a great opportunity to show that in the end all wounds, although were, they were tremendous, ultimately uh, healed with those survivors in particular. On one side, the side facing the beaches is uh, inscribed in English on what I think is a large piece of marble or granite. On the reverse side, facing away from the beaches, uh, is the same message in uh, Japanese, symbolizing uh, the size of the invasion beaches that each side was on. So Japanese on the actual land itself and the Marines coming off the shore or off the ocean onto the shore. So from that point, uh, it's a, a straight shot to Suribachi. Um, although we will take a break at the base of Suribachi before we start uh, walking up what eventually is a winding path up the north side of the mountain. One of the things we get to appreciate is, is on this very long walk towards Suribachi is that every step we take it increases in size. Compared to the little tiny island that is Iwo Jima, Mount Suribachi is a very imposing feature. Uh, one of the things you see when you approach it is this incredible gradient. This is a very, very steep uh, mountain. And so essentially Colonel Atsuchi, who was the uh, commander of the uh, Suribachi defensive sector, had 2,800 men um, that were responsible for defending it. And all of them lived inside of this mountain. This is a tremendous feature uh, with multiple layers of interlocking caves. We only see a very small amount of that, but it gives you an idea of the size of this behemoth uh, structure that we lied within. In the last few steps of this climb, we uh, enter what is a remarkable plateau at the top of this enormous feature. Uh, this is the caldera for the uh, volcano. Suribachi in Japanese essentially means mixing bowl. Uh, so it was kind of has the, it's a pretty accurate depiction for what this essentially is. But you, as you look down the sides of the cliff face, you can see uh, volcanic fins that are erupting sulfur all the time, pretty much. Uh, some of the sulfur that's left on the surface. So you get a feeling this is a very otherworldly like place, as just as the Marines would have noticed in uh, February through March of 1945. One of the most notable features on top of this particular mountain is the fact that it's being used essentially as a memorial uh, on top of a memorial, which is essentially the entire island of Iwo Jima. They're roughly divided between American and Japanese memorials. So all the prefectures in Japan have a memorial to commemorate the loss of life from each one of their independent areas uh, for the people that they've contributed to the 109th Infantry Division that perished on Iwo Jima. Uh, also, another kamikaze grade uh, mar marker lies there as well. For the American side, of course, the 5th Infantry uh, Marine Division actually installed a very large marker in 1949 which overlooks the invasion beaches. Uh, there's also a small marker indicating uh, the flag raising, the historic spot by which the flag raising was, was uh, photographed. Uh, so you'll see, uh, again, a lot of different uh, things going on on the top of the mountain. It's, but the point of it all is to commemorate essentially the Battle of, of, of Iwo Jima and what transpired in just two months of an island's history. Uh, the mountain's about 500-ish uh, feet high, maybe uh, close to 600. Um, 
at least elevation gain from the place where you start hiking up from. Um, and then we get up there around lunchtime. So it's perfect, you get up there, people are tired, uh, let them sit, eat their lunch, drink, uh, and then I'll tell them, hey, you know, 15, 20 minutes, if you wanna to listen to me talk about the battle, I'll be right over here. Um, and then uh, probably the most poignant thing I think that's up there is uh, there are two concrete posts um, that when we were up there were laying down for some reason. I don't know why they were. Uh, they might have just been laying down under the sheer weight of the things that are on it or somebody laid them down because it's fairly windy. But I say it's poignant because on each of these posts are hundreds, maybe thousands, of uh, trinkets that primarily Marines have left upon their visit there. So a lot are dog tags, a lot are patches, uh, name tags um, with the last name or maybe a name tag like this with wings or something. But again, by and large, they're dog tags and that's why it's probably pretty heavy and that's why they might have fallen over. So while we're up there again, people relax, eat, enjoy the view, uh, and then when they're ready, I'll start talking about the battle. And now I'll kind of explain with an aerial view, for lack of a better term, what actually happened. So we'll talk about the 500 or so ships out there in the ocean, um, the days before the battle begins. Um, we'll talk about again the objectives of the 4th Marine Division, which were hitting the beaches closest to us at Suribachi. How they were supposed to cut off Suribachi in the first day how they were supposed to get across to the other side of the island as quickly as possible. And I say the other side of the island, when you get up there, you realize how small the island is. So it's only about eight square miles. So you're talking about two-ish, three miles wide, three-ish, four miles long. So eight square miles, it's very small. It's not like Okinawa, which again is a small island, but it's not nearly this small. So you can stand up there in Suribachi and you see absolutely everything. But you can point out to the folks what was supposed to happen and what actually occurred, how the Marines were stuck in the beaches um, for two main reasons. The difficulty of getting vehicles, men, equipment on that sand and up the, uh, the, the, uh, the beaches, and also and primarily the, the strategy of the Japanese to defend the island, allowing the Marines to gain a foothold on the beaches, let them do that for about an hour or so, and then as all this men and equipment, tanks, land tracks, tractors, you name it, as they are trying to get on the beach, which was very difficult to do because of the sand, uh, then they are wait for those beaches to be packed with all those things I just talked about and just let loose with artillery. And then right before I leave, I'll make sure I talk about the actual raising of the flag, that story. That's been, uh, and that's, that's probably one of the main reasons why Ujima is, is so ingrained in American military history is that picture that was taken by Joe Rosenthal of the American flag being raised. Um, and it was the second time it was raised that morning. Um, it was a source of stamps, posters, war bonds that were sold back there in World War II, uh, a source of movies, most notably, most recently, Flags of Our Fathers. So pretty famous event. In this case, one of the things I also make a point about is the fact that the flag raising uh, meant a lot to people on the ground because it meant to them that the Suribachi defensive sector was finally rendered uh, combat ineffective. That essentially they would stop getting fired at from their reverse positions while they could continue their advance on the rest of the island. This is a life and death issue for people on the island in February of 1945 when the flag went up. Now, additionally to that, back in the United States, people saw it as a great morale boost. Uh, the fact that this flag raising was uh, such a, something that was so easy to portray, to capture the, the sentiment of the American fighting man moving forward, ever forward, to uh, inevitable victory. Um, so we're probably up there for 30, 45 minutes tops. As we get down to the base of the mountain, as opposed to backtracking towards the beach, we'll take a quick spin off uh, track to a gun emplacement. It's a Japanese um, coastal or ship mounted gun that was essentially emplaced into this uh, the base of the mountain. 
Uh, it's now exposed to the elements, but it used to be encased in a concrete bunker or pillbox. Um, and uh, so it's a pretty cool thing to walk up to, touch, walk around, take pictures. One of these guns uh, witnessed some American ships are getting pretty close to shore. They witnessed uh, some what turned out to be Navy divers, so precursor to Navy SEALs, uh, underwater, underwater demolition teams, that were executing their mission to analyze the beaches, um, analyze the currents. Uh, at any rate, whatever their mission was, they were seen. One of these guns engaged them, which was not the intent of the overall Japanese commander, because he kind of wanted to lay in wait. And so once these guns opened up, they exposed themselves, uh, and so they were uh, the target of U.S. Navy counterfire from the ships. And so I think 13 of those guns, um, of however many they had to begin with, but 13 were destroyed. The two most important things that I think people want to see is the top of Suribachi and walk the beaches with that black volcanic uh, rock or sand. The next stop uh, is something that I know everyone on the tour has been long awaiting. We had the course of the last couple of hours have been walking alongside the invasion beaches, the black sand beaches that are so synonymous with Iwo Jima, but we just didn't have an opportunity to go there until uh, the return part of the trip. So at this point, finally, people can finally indulge their desire to go experience what the Marines experienced during the invasion in February of 1945 and uh, sink into the sand on the beach, collect a little bit of it to, uh, to, to share with members of the unit back home. So. In the course of this, I always remind people this is an optical illusion. As they look down on the beach, it's a tremendous distance to the water, water's edge, uh, partially because of what they call terracing, uh, the idea that the sand uh, is being built up into small hills uh, over the course of tidal erosion and so forth. You won't find seashells in the sand at Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is, as I mentioned, a volcanic island, so inevitably, Everything that you find there is something that erupted from the earth at one point in time or another, as magma or as uh, igneous rocks that have basically degraded through erosion to the point that they're just sand. And the sand, in the sense, is much closer to like volcanic dirt as far as I can tell. It's got strange properties that I've never seen in sand where I'm familiar with in the United States. Uh, it doesn't compress well. And a lot of the Marines during the course of the battle complained about the fact it was difficult to build foxholes out of it. It just kind of collapses in on itself. It has no ability to retain its structure. So that was one of the, the specific uh, properties of the sand. But the fact that it's completely black when you're used to going to a beach and seeing white, it is kind of something to behold. So I'll try and give folks whatever time we have. In this case, I think as last week, we had about uh, 25, 30 minutes. I can't remember exactly. Um, but let the folks walk along the beach. Uh, people will bring bottles, bags, whatever they can carry the sand in. Scoop a bunch of sand, bring it back with them. Um, and that's a pretty poignant place to kind of just sit and think about uh, what I had been talking about for the previous few hours. or excuse me, hopefully what you've already known from your own personal study. After we leave the beach, we essentially start our progress back towards uh, the base. And in this case, we're going to stop by uh, a large chasm, which is the entrance to an underground tunnel system. Uh, the Owazu Tunnel is what it was referred to, and it's essentially an underground barracks. It's just a massive complex of tunnels, unlike anything I've even seen before that just stretches out in pretty much every conceivable direction. Officially, there's seven miles of tunnels on the island, but I can tell you from personal experience that there are likely many, many more that were sealed through satchel charges or dynamite by tanks, 105s in the course of the battle. General uh, Kurabayashi, who was in charge of the Imperial Japanese Army's defensive plan for the island, uh, understood that it was important to mitigate the tremendous air power and sea power and land power advantage of the United States and what it could bring to bear on the island. And the only way he knew that was to draw the enemy in as close as possible and use essentially hand-to-hand -hand fighting techniques. Uh, so inevitably his idea was to withdraw from the beach defensive scheme of the different battles that had preceded it and allow the invading forces to get as far inland as possible and use natural terrain features as part of that defensive plan. Are you feeling good? 
So in his case, the idea was to dig down, dig deep, uh, underground uh, hospitals, underground barracks, every uh, command post, uh, everything you could possibly imagine an army would need above ground, he placed below ground on Iwo Jima. And for that reason, most uh, service members never saw a living opponent until they were in the, um, basically, at the end of their life. Um, you know, I talked about the defensive strategy of the Japanese was to uh, lie in wait um, and not defend the beaches, which they had tried on most every previous Marine or Army invasion of a Pacific island. They always lost a lot of troops in doing so. It was never effective. They were never able to hold the beach and keep us from landing. So the Japanese general, uh, Kuribayashi, decides that uh, he's going to dig tunnels. He's going to uh, make caves or uh, make best use of the caves that are already there. It's a volcanic island, so there's natural caves throughout. Uh, he's going to dig more caves. He's going to have these caves and tunnel complexes interlinked with each other. So uh, if need be, a Japanese defender, when he can no longer hold that portion of the island, he can always boogie on back through a cave to another part of the island and help other uh, Japanese soldiers and sailors defend that part of the island. I'll lead folks down into this tunnel with uh, my cohort, whoever's going there with me as a, a kind of alternate lead, if you will. I will be tailing Charlie to make sure no one uh, gets lost. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to get from one end of the tunnel to the other. Uh, it's a different exit from where you enter. And then after that, it is time to hightail it back up to the flight line, go to the bathroom, get a drink, jump on the KC-135 and flight home. So all told, and we started at 5 o'clock in the morning in the PAX terminal and we ended up uh, landing back at Kadena, I think around 6.30 or 7 at night. So, good 14 hour day. Iwo Jima, to me, is still an enigma. The first time that I set foot on the island, I expected to find a large battlefield that would have shown uh, every evidence of this massive violent conflict between two world powers. Uh, when I landed, though, I even approaching the island, you see just a little tiny dot in the vast blue Pacific. You walk out of the aircraft and it's really quite serene. It's, it's quiet and it's windswept. This is an, a, a nice place to be for the most part. But then of course there is lies the second enigma, the fact that this was a place of tremendous suffering. That when you look down on the ground and you see the little bits of metal and the little UXOs that remain, that this is in fact the site of all of that suffering and more. You get underground and you feel the heat in those tunnels, you smell the sulfur as you walk in the most obscure places on the island, and you realize that this would have been an otherworldly place, just as it was described by the, the veterans of that conflict. And you realize, in fact, maybe your perceptions are all wrong, and sometimes you just need to see and experience something to truly appreciate it.